the creepy murder in room 1046. On January 2nd, 1935 at approximately 1.20 p.m., Roland T. Owen made a reservation for room 1046 at the Hotel President in Kansas City. Witnesses describe him as between 20 and 35 years old, having dark hair, a scar on his head that was visible above his ear, and cauliflower ears. He looked sharp in a black coat. Welcome back to our channel. Let us take you through the mystery of the creepy murder in room 1046. You can subscribe to our channel by clicking here. Randolph Propst, the bellhop, assisted Owen to his room and noted that Owen appeared to have just brought a brush, comb, and toothpaste. According to the maid, Mary Soptic, Owen gave her permission to clean while he was in the room, but requested that she not lock the door as she was leaving because his friend was due to arrive. Soptic claimed that save for one dim lamp, Owen kept the drapes securely closed and the lights off. As more employees joined the meeting, they too brought up this fact. According to the maid Soptic's statement to the police, she believed that Owen was either anxious or terrified and that he always preferred to kind of keep in the dark. At four o'clock, Soptic came with fresh towels and discovered Owen lying on the bed, fully dressed and with the door unlocked. A letter that said, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes, wait was also visible to her. Soptic returned the following day, January 3rd at 10.30 a.m. to clean the room. When she looked outside and saw that the door was secured, she thought that Owen had done so before leaving the room. Although Owen was inside, the lights were off, indicating that someone else had probably shut the door from the outside of the room. When Owen answered a call while Soptic was still in the room, he stated, no, Don, I don't want to eat, I'm not hungry. I just had breakfast. And then he repeated, no, I'm not hungry. In the late afternoon, Soptic returned. From inside the room, she could make out two male voices. She heard a gruff voice ask, who is it? As she knocked. Even though there were no more towels in the room, the man answered, we don't need any, when she stated that she had fresh towels. A female guest in room 1048 claimed to hear male and female cursing on the same floor during the night. However, it seemed like a party was going on that evening in room 1055 things now start to get odd. Around 7 a.m. on January 4th, the following morning, the hotel phone operator noticed that Owen's hotel room phone had been off the hook for some time without being used. She then ordered Propst, the bellhop, to go to 1046 upstairs. Propst knocked a few times, hearing a low voice say, come in, turn on the lights. But the door was locked and no one was getting up to let him in despite the don't disturb sign on the locked door. Propst yelled, put the phone back on the hook, after repeatedly knocking because he believed Owen was intoxicated. About an hour and a half later, the phone was still ringing and another bellhop, Harold Pike, used the pass key to enter the room using only the light from the hallway. Pike saw Owen in bed, naked, and appeared to be intoxicated. He also observed that Owen was surrounded by darker bedding. He corrected the phone stand that had been knocked over and reinserted the phone into the receiver. The phone came out of the receiver again around 10.30 to 10.45 a.m. Propst, the original bellhop, was dispatched to handle the situation. He found himself in front of a genuinely horrifying image when he opened the door. He told the police this is what he saw when he entered the room. When I entered the room, this man was within two feet of the door on his knees and elbows holding his head in his hands. I noticed blood on his head, so I turned on the light. I looked around, and there was blood on the walls, on the bed, and in the bathroom. This frightened me, so I immediately left the room and went downstairs. Owen was found to have severe wounds. The cord had been wrapped around his neck, wrists, and ankles to bind him. He seems to have undergone torture. Even the wall and ceiling above the bed were stained with blood. The frequent blows cracked his skull to the head. Additionally, he had received many chest stab wounds. His lung had been pierced. 
His neck had some bruising, indicating that he had been strangled. Amazingly, Owen was still alive in some way. Owen would be questioned about anyone else who had been in the room by one of the detectives when they arrived on the scene. Nobody was Owen's response even though he wasn't totally conscious and hardly able to speak. I fell against the bathtub, he said. He was brought to the hospital after this brief exchange since he was unconscious. A doctor reported that the wounds on Owen's body had developed six to seven hours before he was found. Detectives excluded suicide by discovering no weapon or any of Owen's items in the room. On the phone stand, four fingerprints may belong to a female. On January 5th, after midnight, Owen passed away in the hospital. Although Roland T. Owen was listed as being from Los Angeles by Owen when he first checked into the hotel, Los Angeles officials could not locate him raising the question of whether or not it was the victim's real name. At Melody McGilly Funeral Home, his body was made available for viewing. As word of the incident spread, more and more people contacted the Kansas City Police to inquire about the possibility that Owen was their missing loved one. The enigmatic Don, to who Owen had made multiple references while at the hotel, was the next target for the police. Don might have also been the man with the deep voice the maid had heard outside the hotel door. However, the police's search brought up nothing. The Journal Post reported on March 3rd that Owen would be laid to rest in Potter's Field. However, an unidentified person called the Melody McGilly Funeral Home and promised to send the funds required to give Owen a respectable funeral. And sure enough, on March 23rd, an unknown sender sent cash to the funeral home wrapped in a newspaper. Owen's grave was anonymously decorated with funeral flowers from the Rock Flower Company and a message that read, Love forever, Louise. A friend of Ruby Ogletree discovered an American Weekly article detailing the Owen case around a year and a half later, in 1936. Ruby would recognize Owen as her son who left Birmingham in 1934 after looking at the magazine. Artemis Ogletree was Owen's real name, just 17 years old. He had sent his mother, Ruby Ogletree, three letters in the spring of 1935. However, a spectacular tabloid report of the murder investigation claimed that these letters were typed and delivered after Owen's passing. Given that Artemis couldn't order, this was especially strange. The letter's tone was slangy and strange to Ruby Ogletree. It was later discovered that Artemis Ogletree had also spent time with another man, possibly Don, at St. Regis in Kansas City. Dr. John Horner, who wrote a thorough analysis of the murder case published by the Kansas City Public Library, received a call about Artemis Ogletree in the early 2000s. The caller claimed to have discovered a box of newspaper clippings regarding the Ogletree murder among an older adult's possessions. The caller claimed that there was another item in the box, something more than the newspaper article seemed to have mentioned. Sadly, the caller omitted to specify what the object was. After that, there would be no more developments in the case, and it would vanish into oblivion. This is all for this video. Don't forget to like and share. We will be back soon with another informative video. See you soon.